Hi, thank you. Let's talk some deep learning and some AI. So my name is Nora, just as you mentioned, and I'm originally from Sweden, so Swedish is my first language. I've been living in San Francisco for two years now, and I'm currently bootstrapping my startup where I'm trying, I'm training deep learning and AI algorithms for cancer researchers to help them understand how their cancer cells are behaving and also examining their stem cells. So if there's anything I want you to remember me by is that I love deep learning and I love to apply deep learning on everything. And when I mean everything, I mean everything. So just a hint to get you, to get you started to understand like one of my side projects that I'm having. I'm sure everyone here knows the struggle of reselling stuff on Craigslist. First you have to snap a photo, whatever you want to sell, and then you have to write an ad for that. And when you're searching for products, then you have to look through badly written ads or confusing ads. So I thought, why not train a model that just that will write the ad for you by just looking at the image of whatever you want to sell? So I trained a model on furniture. And basically, I made it look at thousands of images of couches and read through thousands of different ads. And here you see, this is where I'm showing an image for, to the model. And it looks at different parts of the couch, like the seating and the back and the seating again and the back seating. And then it writes a headline for that ad. And it's in Swedish, so you just have to trust me on this one. <laughs> <laughs> it says, Sin sofa i ekta skin, which basically means nice couch and genuine leather. So not only it understands different fabrics, but it also writes like creative headlines like this one as well. All this white part is where it looks at the different pieces of the couch. Also looks at the table over there and says, we're selling our nice and comfortable couch because we are moving. And I'm like, who's we? <laughs> <laughs> so this algorithm thinks that I have a family. I, get, I do, so it's, it's kind of right. But except for pretty silly furniture generating ads. I'm also working with serious deep learning. And I trained some different models where researchers can get help by understanding how their cancer cells are behaving. Or in this case, instead of having a human spending hours looking at low contrast images like this one, trying to find the different cancer cells, I tried different models that will find the cancer cells and count them for the research in just a matter of seconds. And the talk today, uh, we're going to go through how you can build your own AI app with just three easy steps, starting with the idea itself, finding something you can apply the technology on, moving on to the data, which is a very time consuming, but a very valuable resource, ending up with the training. I'm going to show you how, what the model actually sees when you're showing a picture to it. So when you think about state of the art deep learning or AI, you might think about complex solutions like self-driving cars or Google Home, intelligent assistants or cancer cells that I'm, that I'm working with. But the key takeaway with this presentation is that it doesn't have to be that complex. It could be something that you're passionate about or some interest. It could be an easy day-to-day -day problem like this couch ad writing model. In this case, when it saw this couch, it said, don't really know why we're selling it, but we're renewing, so here we go. <laughs> <laughs> so it's pretty creative. <laughs> or this model, I tried to train a model down this, uh, that points out where the trees are, pictures. And let me frame it like this. We're not there yet. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it will get there eventually. So it could be something like you encounter every day. Or it could be a mega trend like globalization or demographical shifts or climate change. So what did I come up with? I'm spending a lot of time in front of the mirror every day because I enjoy looking like this. And I guess other men and women do the same. Because of this, I'm also Googling or I'm searching for inspiration at YouTube for makeup tutorials. The only problem is that when you search for makeup tutorials, you get over 30 million results. You can try it for yourself. You get literally over 30 million results. 
And beauty being a $400 billion market tells you that beauty and makeup plays a significant part of people's lives. So I'm spending a lot of time, a lot of people are currently spending a lot of time because of the market share, and there's over 30 million videos out there. How do you know, or how do I know which one of these videos that will show me a makeup that will fit my particular face or my particular facial features? So I thought I can solve this using AI. I can bridge this gap with using AI. So that's the first part. Find something to apply the technology on. It doesn't have to be complex. It could be as easy as makeup. So the second part is data, finding a data set. So deep learning has excelled in taking high dimensional data, such as images, videos, or documents, and converting them into low dimensional, classifying them in low dimensional categories. So basically you're showing an image, and the model tells you which category it belongs to. So back to the problem that I had. There's over 30 million videos. Which one should I look at, or which one will tell me how, what kind of makeup will look best on my face? And what kind of data could I feed the model to make it, to, to help it show me that? So I started to look at, at those videos, examining facial features, and you have a lot of facial features. You have a nose, you have shins, eyebrows, a mouth. But the most time-consuming, and most striking parts were the eyes. So I decided to focus on the eyes. And I narrowed down the problem a bit more into eye shapes, because there's a lot of videos out there telling you what kind of makeup you should wear according to your eye shape. So I thought, could I train a model that understands eye shapes and can recognize different eye shapes? So frame this as an image recognition, image classification problem, where you show an image to the model, and it will tell you which category it actually belongs to. So, and I'll dig, dig further into eye shapes, and there are four of them, four distinct eye shapes, basically. Round eyes, monolithic eyes, hooded eyes, and almond-shaped eyes. There's a lot of varieties to those, but those four are the most distinct ones. So I had the problem, uh, I had the eye shape decided. So I started to look for data because I didn't have any pictures to start with. And I found an open data set with thousands of images of celebrities. And I really, really want to stress this because you don't have to have a data set to start with. You can use existing and open data sets and apply your knowledge to it and convert that data set into a unique data set that will work for your model. So I manually cropped hundreds of images of eyes, of <laughs> celebrities' eyes. Divided them into these four different categories. Those observations are almond eyes, hooded eyes, monolith eyes, and round eyes. And just in summary, four different categories. I cropped 200 images of each category for training, and then 100 more for validation. And the reason I'm showing you the, in this structure, because I prepared a repo, if you want to try to train your own model, you just have to place all the images in this folder structure, but I'll get back to that. That's the piece about the data. And once again, you don't have to start with your own data set. You can transform or relabel or re-annotate the existing data sets by applying your own knowledge to it. So the last part, which is training, the most exciting part because you get to see what the model actually learned and you have to see what the model sees when you're showing the pictures. So by a show of hands, how many here knows what a convolutional neural network is? Yeah, yeah, a lot. And how many here knows how convolutional operations works? Okay, a few. So when you're training your model, you can either train it from scratch where you initialize it with randomly random weights or you can go with transfer learning where you use pre-trained weights, weights that you've been training on huge data sets. And it's just as it sounds like, you're transferring knowledge from pre-trained weights into your network. And that's what I did with my set because I had a pretty small data set. So I used pre-trained weights that have been trained on ImageNet consisting of over a million images and divided into a thousand different categories. And that's a very common trick if you have a small data set, just as I did. And when you go with pre-trained weights, you can 
choose between a lot of different architectures, ranging from smaller nets with fewer operations into larger networks with a lot of operations. I went with one called VGG16 because it's a fairly, the structure is fairly easy to understand and it's easy to apply to simple classification problems like, like mine was. So VGG. These are the five blocks of the network or the architecture that I went with. So five convolutional pooling layers and one fully connected layer at this end which will decide which category the image belongs to. And here you see the funnel just horizontally where you see the high dimension and gradually the dimensions are reduced and then the output is a category. So just to get a hint of what the, what the network actually see when you train it. So there are two different operations, two convolution operation and one pooling step, basically. So essentially, all images can be represented as a matrix with their pixel values. So let's pretend that this image only has pixel values that are either 0 or 1. It's simplified because it's a color image that's between 0 and 255. But in this case, let's pretend that all the pixels are either 1 or 0. So what you do during the training, you use a very a smaller matrix, a filter, or a transformational matrix. It's that one, 2 by 2 matrix. And you're letting that matrix slide over the input image, and for each step, you perform element-wise multiplication, and the output is added together into one single digit. So this little matrix that slides over the input image will create a new matrix that is a feature, a feature map, a new representation of that input, basically. And this occurs at all the steps throughout the entire network, not at the fully connected one, but all the other blocks. The other operation that occurs when you're forcing the model or the network to just keep the most important features. So it's a pooling step. So you look at the, at the parts of the, the new matrix that you got, and then you're forcing it to only keep the most significant parts of it, like here, number two, and in this case, two. And that occurs every time the dimension is reduced. So it's a downsampling step, basically. So just back to what I mentioned about training from scratch or using transfer learning. So when you're training from scratch, that little transformational matrix will have randomly initialized numbers. But when you go with transfer learning, you will have a set of small matrices that already know exactly what to look for, like edges or colors or shapes. And that's why I'm using transfer learning. So that's the difference between those two and methodologists. And since we're going to use pre-trained weights, we're locking all of the convolutional layers. So instead of having this little random matrix sliding, we're going to go with pre-trained matrices that already know exactly what to look for. Like in this case, this will look for edges of the image. And this is the first layer, so it's 64 different small filter matrices. We'll still slide over the input image but it will look for edges in this case, or trying to invert the colors of the input image. There. And since all of them are locked, you can see exactly what the network will see at the different steps or the different blocks, like this very first block. 64 different filters. The second one, we're increasing to 128. And some of these are pretty scary, further down <laughs> in the network. And between each block, we are forcing the model to just keep the most important pixels, like over here. Increase the filter to 256, and then last 512, and the very last 512. And here you see how the dimension is reduced all the way down into the fully connected layer. activation function I'm using is a nonlinear activation function to get the relationship between uh, the image data, like the nonlinear relationships. And the very last activation function is a softmax, which will tell, it's, since it's a multi-class 
problem, it will tell you the probability for each class, basically. So just a recap. We use pre-trained weights, trained on ImageNet. The architecture is VGG16. Uh, all the convolutional blocks are locked, and I'm using a nonlinear activation function. A dropout rate just to make the model generalize better. A last fully connected layer that's customized. And I'm running this for 50 epochs, 16 images at a time until the entire network, until the network have seen all of the images. So, and it might sound a complex or it might sound like a huge network, but I really want to show you how few lines of code you need to recreate all of this. I'm building it in Keras, a high level deep learning framework. And this is basically all needed to train your own model. You're starting with the base model, those locked layers. You're building your own little top with four different categories. In my case, four different eye shapes. Initialize the model object, locking all those layers because you want to keep those small filters. Compile, train, and save the model. So this is every, all the code that you need to train your own model. OK, so back to this, my classification problem. What a courtesy do you think? It is cheap. Any takes? 99.5. And <laughs> 99? 83. 83? OK. 27. 77. OK. 85. Too late. Sorry. <laughs> A good guess, though. 90 to 93% accuracy, which a very good starting point, basically, for further optimization. That's the three parts. Just to recap, starting with an idea. It doesn't have to be complex. It can be something you're interested in. Finding data. Use existing data sets if you don't already have data available. And last, train the model. And since the accuracy were so high, I decided to build uh, an app out of this. So I built a front end, a very simple front end using Angular and Bootstrap, a back end where I placed the model and there were placed the network itself. Looks like this when it's in Python and not in a Jupyter notebook. So all of this condensed into these 15 lines of code. And I connected the front end with the back end using a very simple Flask app, uh, Python web server framework, basically that takes the image from the front end, showing it to the back end, getting the prediction, and sending it back to the front end. And I prepared a repo with this, with a front end where you upload the picture, send it to the back end, and it tells you what your eye shape is, or whatever model you train it with. And here it is. I, just to see what's in there, a Jupyter notebook where you just put your data into this folder structure, data, and then a training folder and a validation folder where you place the classes that you want to train. So if you want to train a model that knows the difference between cats and dogs, for instance, then you call it cats and dogs. And you do the same for validation, cats and dogs. So at the end, it should look like this. And then you just save the model and I prepared a front end for it where you can upload images and try, try the model. It's super simple <laughs> in React. So here it is, if you want to try. So just for conclusions, I love AI, and I love to apply deep learning on all my problems, basically, like all, everything from makeup to furniture, furniture apps. Um, but I'm also into serious topics like cancer research. And so my drive is to convert ideas into real products. And I really believe that it's an important part of learning to take a project and create something end to end. So the very last part, I have a demo. So here it is, and that's the makeup.
Thank you. Thank you. And I will stick around. So if you have any questions, please come to me afterwards.